Okay, so today we're going to do an overview of uh, installing Linux and also some of the benefits of Linux. Um, I'm going to try to keep this uh, fairly short um, and straightforward. So we'll do a few introductory slides about why Linux is good and we'll also talk a little bit about um, some of the advantages that it has. And then we'll do uh, a basic intro about how to get started. Um, I'm going to use Linux Mint, which is this OS right here. Um, it looks a lot like Windows and uh, functions a lot like Windows. There will be some uh, things that we talk about like command line, which is going to be something that if you want to try to really dip your toes into Linux, you'll have to understand, but maybe not something for everyone. Um, and we'll go on from there. So we'll do a quick Overview of Linux distributions. Again, this is something that we covered in a, a previous OS comparison, and is something that um, you know is is a vast uh, sort of ecosystem of things that you can cover to understand exactly what Linux is. There's many, many different flavors. Um, that being said, they're all still Linux, so there's many things that are you know very similar. So once you start learning Linux, then you can art, sort of test and try and pick and choose which kind of Linux distribution you want. Um, some key concepts to understand that uh, relates a little bit more to the command line and some of the the various the variations between distributions. Useful commands and then also we'll go through a setup and installation and then I'll do a, a run through of how to install Linux Mint on a on a desktop platform. So the first big question for anyone who wants to do uh, Linux or anything like this is basically why. Um, you know the the main thing that I like about Linux is the fact that it's open source, uh, it's free, so you have the the flexibility to sort of mess around with it. You can try different platforms, you can do uh, many different things. Like, for example, on Windows, if you uh, end up installing a Windows copy, then it tries to lock you down to the platform that you're installed on. So, for example, if I just want to refresh, I just want to completely nuke everything and start from scratch. Um, you know, I may run into license problems if I just download and reinstall uh, the latest version of Windows. I have to use the official recovery that was provided by the ODM, and oh, by the way, that is like this dependent. So if I have a drive failure, then I might be out of luck. Um, you know, it shouldn't be the case, but it generally requires at least a phone call to support. And, you know, a lot of times that may be not what I'm doing or is not, you know, in my best interest. Maybe I just want to run a virtual machine. I just want to have basic access to something. That's when Linux comes in. Um, yeah, that sort of speaks a little bit to the no vendors uh, portion here. Um, is it the future? So that's another question. Linux is becoming more and more popular. Um, you know, in the OS uh, distribution slides, I talk about how uh, Linux, even though, you know, it's not one of the most popular desktop platforms, it's used on more servers than Windows. It's also used on more mobile platforms if you count Android. Um, Android is a Linux-based uh, operating system, and it's also the most popular mobile um, operating system in the world right at the moment. And, you know, even, even its largest competitor, which is iOS, you know, iPhones and iPads, you know, their base is actually, uh, you know, goes all the way back to BSD, which is also a POSIX compli compliant system, which is also very similar to Linux because Linux was based on Unix and BSD was also a derivative of Unix uh, back in the day. Um, no limits. Um, this is something which Windows tends to be just a little bit uh, annoying about. You know, if, if you are running Windows 10 Pro, you're probably okay. It's the more expensive distribution. By and large, I think the majority of people who are home users are probably only using, are only running Windows 10 Home, which really restricts you in terms of what you can actually do. Windows 10 Home is like the default, which is included in almost any desktop out there, almost any uh, notebook out there uh, that you buy off Tiger Direct or you know Amazon or you know going into Best Buy, etc. All of them are Windows 10 Home, and for the majority of people, that doesn't matter. But as soon as you need to start playing with things like, oh, I want to try Docker. Oh, Docker needs Windows 10 Pro because Windows 10 Pro has the Hyper-V extensions and allows you to work with it. Oh, I want to use like some more advanced features. Well, none of those services are available on Windows 10 Home. So it really like very quickly becomes a bit of a problematic experience for a lot of people. And Linux doesn't have any of these problems because it's it's free by default. 
and all these things you can install. You can, uh, it may require some command knowledge, but everything is like there and the functionality is there and you can pretty much tweak any Linux distro to exactly what you want. Um, there's complete freedom in that. Uh, the only lack of is issues is, you know, app applications are not quite as robust or maybe not quite as prevalent, um, particularly if you're looking for things like gaming or, you know, some professional uh, editing tools like Adobe. And we'll cover a little bit more about, you know, what alternatives there are in, the, in that situation. You know, freedom to reinstall, upgrade hardware, no licensing, etc. Again, this is, um, it's, it's really, in a lot of ways, uh, freeing to be able to take a, a completely new computer or a good computer and just like spin up a bootable USB and then just start using that USB and being able to, to run a completely different operating system. Uh, you can do that with Linux very, very easily and I'll go through some of the steps of how to do that. Um, it's You have total freedom in terms of what exactly you want to do and the types of things that you want to run. Um, You'll never really have to worry about things like drive failures other than like standard data loss. So if you just do like normal backups, then you'll be fine. You don't need to worry about, I need to like have like an image and I, and I pray to God that that image is going to work if I need to reboot that image onto my system. You, you really can, can just be a little bit freer in terms of your workflow and your, and your, your usage habits. Um, not to say that imaging and uh, you know, real, real good backups are bad. They're, they're definitely necessary and good. Um, the other, the other thing is it's less virus prone than Windows. Um, not immune. Uh, there's definitely ways in which people can, can come in, lock in, and steal your data. But the very fact that Linux by default will ask for an admin password before you can install any sort of application or do any sort of update. And the fact that it's, you know, it's only about 2% or less of like the actual desktop systems out there. So it's, it's less, it's less targeted. So by its failure, it's more secure, which makes it better. Um, I don't know if that's going to last forever. Probably not. But that being said, uh, at the current state, of, the way this current state of things is, is that there's a lot less viruses out there and it is much harder to hack into, say, a, uh, a Linux computer just because they require your passwords before they install any sort of software. There's a lot of, um, immediate updates for a lot of the things that you're looking for and the fact that you know Linux you can always update it you know you're not going to run into a, sy a system where it's like oh I'm still using Windows 7 and Windows 7 is like oh well sorry all the security updates are done in 2020 or I'm still using Windows XP you, know, you can still keep using a, win uh, a Linux box and you can always update to the latest version and there's no there's no cost you can always be on the latest and greatest things and there's many distributions out there which are almost perpetually updated so you can you can do a lot of things to make sure that your Linux distribution is secure, has the latest patches, updates, um, and you know it's running like really strict firewalls. And there's so many different uh, ways in which you can identify those firewalls. Um, the other thing which I don't really list here, uh, I don't know a whole lot about it. I've stopped using Windows since Windows 7. I've pretty much only just slightly touched upon Windows 10, um, but Windows is also getting a little bit more ad centric and also you know, building in a lot more bundles in order to increase their profit margins, which is, you know, I guess good for them. And a lot of people are doing that. Android also kind of does that a lot uh, for a lot of the, the OEM phones that are out there. But at the same time, uh, Linux is it's yours, basically. You you control the source code. You control the, the, the file system. Even if you don't understand it, you can still remove packages at however you want. So you can pretty much change however the system performs and how the... Um, you know, what's actually running on your computer once you start getting into the nitty gritty and really understanding everything. So there's, you know, once you install a Linux platform, there might be a lot of default applications. You can remove any of them. Um, if you even break it, then there's ways to recover yourself and, and reinstall. It's it's very flexible in that, in that regard. Um, so it's just a lot of the fear with computing and trying things is kind of gone with Linux because, you know, at the end of the day, as long as you backed up all the files that you wanted to, if you need to do a fresh reinstall, then you can just do it. So a long-winded answer, but there's there's a lot of advantages, I think, to, to using Linux. Uh, so what is Linux? So there's distribution and fragmentation. Fragmentation is a negative term. Distribution is a positive term. And the fact that there's lots of choices also means that there's sort of a downside where you have this uh, apparent 
fragmentation of the desktop and the, the user interface. There's too many choices for people to really understand, so the majority of people don't choose any and they keep using Windows. Um, that's a problem that Linux has always had and will always have because it's open source, so anyone can go out and create a new Linux distribution if they have the know-how, time, resources to do so. Um, there's many different options out there. Uh, there's people who work on things that are at the kernel level. Again, we covered that a little bit in the OS um, side. The kernel is the underlying layer and what sort of interacts between the topper, the upper uh, echelon of applications and the bottom uh, tier of the hardware and, and trying to get the firmware and everything to work together. Um, the major kernels are out there right now. I would say by and large are Ubuntu, which is this orange symbol here, and Red Hat, which is this Red Hat symbol right here. Red Hat has a lot of derivatives like uh, CentOS, which is right here, and there's also um, Red Hat's sort of open source variant, which is called Fedora, um, which I, I've been using recently, and it's it's actually pretty nice. It's um, Then there's another sort of distribution line, which is also getting a lot of attention right at the moment, which is called Arch. Um, and the, the major OS uh, using Arch right at the moment for, you know, the average desktop user is Manjaro, which is this big M symbol here. Um, recently, there's also a new sort of entrant into the Linux desktop. It's called Clearo, uh, Clear Linux, which is um, this penguin symbol here uh, with very angular shapes. This is actually uh, put together by Intel. It has a lot of really cool features. I'm not going to go into them in this video, but... Um, I felt it was worth a mention because it's kind of like another uh, new player into the space and it has such a large company's backing that it could potentially do a lot of great things in the future. It could become a good uh, desktop OS or server OS choice for people in the future. Um, what I'm going to focus on for these tutorials is going to be Linux Mint, which is running on top of the Ubuntu kernel, um, but comes with an OS, which uh, desktop interface, which is called Cinnamon. And Cinnamon is, you know, sort of graphically pleasing. It, it looks like a very modern operating system, but at the same time, it's also very similar to um, Windows. The future for a lot of uh, desktops right now, and which is cross-platform, is called GNOME. So this, this picture up here on the top is GNOME, and this is running a Fedora, a Fedora build. Um, and GNOME is, is now currently being deployed in Ubuntu since 18.04. Um, they're tweaking it and becoming more GNOME. Uh, as they continue to progress, so they're they're taking away a lot of the the crutches and things like having icons on the desktop, etc. Um, as they continue to progress and they become just more of a GNOME uh, user space, I think it's really nice. I use it myself personally on both my Fedora machines and also my Ubuntu machines. But at the same time, it's a big step away from say a Windows operating environment. So for most of these videos, I chose to just use Cinnamon which I think is just more familiar for most people who are starting from scratch. Um, and GNOME, I think, is is also you know a worthy desktop to look at. It's something that people can definitely play around with. Uh, but the fact that you can't have like icons on your desktop and you have to do a lot of things like Alt-Tab or Alt-Tilde to get through and, and manage through your pages um, might throw a little people off. It's it's lightweight, it's very quick, it's it's very visually pleasing, but the workspace for a lot of people who are very used to point and click, it it might be a little bit disconcerting because you can't just like see everything that's running on a little taskbar at the bottom. They they sort of took all that away and made it into something which is a little bit more like say your tablet or your smartphone where you, you're viewing a full page of one application at a time and then there's other ways in, of getting around the OS to switch between apps. So it's it's a different concept, a different approach. Um, it's, it's definitely in a lot of ways the future because so many ma major operating systems are running it, but at the same time, uh, it's maybe not for everyone. So we're gonna stick with Linux Mint for the majority of these tutorials and uh, hopefully that'll serve everyone well. Um, there are other like major applications. So again, uh, running Linux doesn't mean you have to give up your favorite applications. It may may mean that there's a couple professional uh, paid for applications which are not going to be available. But things like Google Chrome, uh, the open source version which is Chromium, Firefox, uh, VLC, um, Office applications like LibreOffice are available. They're not the Microsoft standard, but you can run like Microsoft Cloud based Office applications on on your variant, so I think Office 365 should be able to work as well. 
Um, and then there's GIMP, which is the GNU or new uh, image manipulation program uh, platform, which uh, works really well as like a, a Photoshop replacement that's available and is really designed for Linux. And there's um, you know so many other things that you can run. Um, and again, once you start learning Linux, you start learning the commands. It it really pays itself forward because all of the operating system out there, only Windows sort of works the way it does. The the commands that you use for uh, Linux, once you start learning them, ninety percent or eighty, at least eighty five percent are going to apply to FreeBSD. FreeBSD commands are also going to apply to a lot of things like on Mac OS. They're also going to apply for the majority of the cloud computing uh, platforms that you're going to be looking at. So if you're looking to get uh, into the space, you're looking to make a professional habit of using uh, the cloud um, servers, you know, anything which is sort of like a more professional grade platform is going to, you know, starting to use Linux on a daily basis is going to, you know, just increase your overall pro productivity and potential in those in those areas. So it's a it's a nice building block and it's like a nice good way to learn things. So how to you know log in, navigate, uh, do things? Um, Linux, the way it's set up is you can, um, you know, you log in when you're lo when you first log into the computer. It's going to ask you for your passwords and your username, and so you just provide that. Um, anyone who has sort of the admin pr privileges, those would be uh, someone who's in the Sudoer group or the Sudo group. Um, sudo basically means like you have the admin privileges. It's similar to if you've ever had to use Windows 10 and open something and click right click and say run as administrator. It's kind of like you're giving root level privileges to this application. Um, Windows is really loose on those permissions just to increase usability. Uh, Linux is, and all sort of POSIX or Unix platforms are much more strict about that so you need to increase the, uh, the level of which you're giving permission to the system and before you can install or upgrade things. Um, the screenshot here shows an example of I'm just using the software manager which is pretty much like the app store for Linux and then in the app store I'm trying to install the Dropbox client onto this uh, this Linux Mint machine and the first prompt right here just shows the password so say I'm, I'm just looking for a new application I want to install Dropbox I put Dropbox I click I want to install it says okay please provide your password as soon as I provide my password it'll install the application and then I'll be ready to go and I can search through my applications for Dropbox and I can set up my client just like I would on a, a Windows machine or a Mac, Mac OS machine so it's it's not too difficult but it's just more secure really is is what I want to get um, the UI again the the, the one thing that that makes it complicated is just the the issue of uh, choices and the choices sort of lead to fragmentation that being said you have choices as opposed to you know any other sort of major operating system out there for the desktop um, uh, if you're talking about Android Android is pretty much just Android but you have tons of choices every OEM like if you buy a Xiaomi phone if you buy a Google Pixel phone if you buy a Samsung phone everyone's gonna have a slightly different take on what Android should look like Similar thing for Linux. Linux is going to have multiple desktops, and every sort of desktop is going to be performed slightly different. Um, even if you install the same desktop, if you're on a different distribution, say for example, I install the GNOME desktop on Ubuntu, and I install the GNOME desktop on Fedora, behavior is not going to be 100% the same. Uh, largely the same, yes, but maybe slightly different. And a lot of desktop platforms out there, like Unity, um, you know, they sort of offer their own sort of tweaks and um, uh, take on you know what these standard desktops would be uh, elementary OS is another good example it's sort of like the Mac equivalent but it also has a GNOME base and there's going to be uh, many different ways in which you can interact with your desktop and you can just really pick whichever one works for you and you can even do so without having to change the operating system you can install different desktop interfaces with on top of the existing operating system or the existing distro uh, that you chose so it's there's just like oodles amount of flexibility with the platform it's really just about understanding it and trying to figure out how it works which I hope this course is going to give you a little bit more ideas about so it's only complicated because you have so many choices overview of useful commands this is a long list I'm gonna kinda of sort of leave it up there um, and I have a screenshot which shows how these commands sort of work for how they interact with you and I'll cover a little bit more about this in the video which is coming uh, really soon um, so ls, you can think of that as like list, 
So it just lists the context of the directory. By the way, if you ever use a Windows machine and you open up the command prompt, you do the same thing, press typing dir. That's basically the, the directory or the, the list command, which in DOS shows all the contents of the directory or the folder that you're inside of. Um, CD, basically change directory. Uh, if you press, if you type CD directory name, like for example here, in this command we say cd documents so now i'm changing my directory from home over to documents and then inside documents i can say nkdir which is the make new directory which make a directory new docs and as soon as i press ls again i can see oh the new docs directory is listed here okay cd new docs there's nothing in new docs so there's no point of pressing ls we just created it cd dot dot that moves us up one echo Moving up a directory. Okay, echo just returns exactly what you just typed to echo. It just shows exactly what you typed to this. This is not at all useful. Um, pretty much if you're just navigating through directories, it's super useful if you're doing anything like scripting, like you're writing little scripts or commands, kind of like programming, but they're just like automated sessions, which help, uh, allow you to navigate or, or to automate certain tasks. Like I need to, um, run this benchmark over and over and over and over again or something or I need to uh, automate my backup so I want to copy like a certain folder of contents to a hard drive you know every 12 hours or something um, you can do that and then echo would then return an output of that um, or whatever output that you that you want to see in the terminal if you have the terminal open when you're running that then it's pretty useful that way uh, sudo, again, we sort of talked about this. This is like the uh, run as admin. Um, it require, it basically requests a root permission and the user that's requesting it has to be part of the sudoers, sudoers group um, and supply his or her password. If, she, if he or she is in the sudoers uh, group of people, then she has the ability to install new applications onto the, onto the machine and then also be able to you know do updates and then run different things which is more of a, a root level uh, privilege um, apt install update upgrade apt is sort of the application package manager for uh, a lot of ubuntu desktops if you are on uh, fedora or red hat or centos you'd probably be using yum y-u-m or you'd be using uh, dnf which is the new one which is being used a lot on fedora um, if you are on arch linux or manjaro it would be pacman if you were on uh, FreeBSD recently, they, they have the package PKG um, manager. It's it's all very similar. It's all POSIX. And this is basically a way for you to install new applications via the command line, update and upgrade. This is super useful for new users um, just because even though they any one of these operating systems, these desktop operating systems do offer a software manager, it, it almost, in my experience and having been a user of Linux for several years, it just breaks down sometimes. And the, the only thing you can really do is, is run the command. Um, there'll, there'll be something like one package which is just unexpected or out of whack. And then the, the Linux will say, I, you know, I, I just don't know what to do. Um, Windows also does have this problem. And then Windows ends up creating new applications which you have to then install like a third party. Say for example, in Windows 10, you have to install something like a, a Windows 10 update assistant to get certain updates to, to really click through and run. So it's, it's not to say that Windows is immune to it, it's just that Windows always offers a, a graphical user interface to help deal with the problem. Uh, but it requires in, installing additional things, you know, lots of Googling, lots of hunting. In Linux, you just, learn this command you learn to be a little bit familiar with the terminal um, sudo apt update sudo apt upgrade these two commands will probably save you know it's like 90 percent of any problems you have whenever you're trying to perform an update the other uh that's 90 percent of the problems you have the other times 90 percent of the time you won't have a problem uh, with a lot of these these linux distros they're getting really really solid at this point so it's um something that you know, people should know, but at the same time, you know, don't freak out uh, too much and don't don't think like this is going to be something that I need to like learn in-depth commands for everything that I want to do. Uh, a lot of times Ubuntu and these Linux distributions, they just work. Um, there's a couple other commands which I wanted to just put in, which is rm, which is remove. That's essentially the delete command. Um, I would say use this with extreme caution. 
oftentimes you don't really need to delete too much via the command line and deleting via the command line doesn't have the same safety nets of saying going into the file manager and deleting files where things are then moved to a, a garbage bin or a recycle bin. It's called trash on on Linux. And then you can just empty the trash bin and be on your merry way. Uh, IPA or ifconfig, these are similar to ipconfig. I used to use ipconfig and ipconfig refresh on Windows all the time. On Linux, uh, particularly Ubuntu, you would say sudo uh, service network manager restart. It basically just sort of does an IP refresh if you're running off a DCP, a DHCP uh, command command unit, but it, it gives you the IP of your system, and that it can often be helpful for any sort of workloads where you're you're working with a group of users. Um, so I also threw that in there. So command line for installing and searching applications uh, on you. Ubuntu, Linux Mint, and a slew of others uh, like Elementary and all these other Ubuntu-based platforms, you just use apt. So you can say apt search or apt install. These are the commands that I offered over here. Apt install, apt update, apt, apt, apt search. Um, what that essentially allows you to do is search for new packages. Uh, Red Hat's NOS Fedora, DMF for Yum, Arch Linux, Manjaro, Pac-Man. Um, if you wanted to just search for like a software, say app search, this is what I'm returning over here, like app search Chrome. Um, you can see all, all these applications with the name Chrome in them uh, come up and you can sort of pick which one you actually want. So this would be say, oh, the Chromium browser. Uh, so we have the Chromium web browser and we can just say sudo apt install Chromium dash browser and we would be able to install uh, that browser package on our on our operating system, we'd be able to install the software. Um, again, mo for the mo majority of the cases, you'll be using the software package manager anyways. It's not it's not like a huge deal, but if for any reason that's not available or it's buggy, um, you can always just revert back to the command line. So there's plenty and plenty of fallbacks to make continue to make Linux useful. Um, the other mention I, that I want to put in is that uh, Linux, in addition to the standard uh, repositories, which would be the sort of standard like .dev or .rpm um, package management platforms like Yum for RPM and uh, the Ubuntu or Debian-based apt, which would be uh, you know .dab. Um, there's also a lot of work right now to make things more cross-platform. So there's two sort of cross-platform utilities for Linux. One is called Flatpak, one is called Snapcraft. Flatpak is kind of available on most distributions. Um, Snapcraft is the go-to uh, uh, software management platform for Ubuntu, uh, but it, again, it's cross-platform. So what they do is they have like a runtime essentially, which runs the application within sort of like uh, a box, um, so that the application has like a common standard and it doesn't have to be compiled in the exact same way that say a Red Hat distribution of Linux or a Debian distribution or an Ubuntu distribution is compiled. Um, it just makes it a lot easier for developers to uh, instantly create their app and then make it available to all Linux users, um, you know, worldwide, uh, without having to worry so much about oh, this is this is only available on Ubuntu platforms, so this is only available on Red Hat platforms, so this is only available on Arch platforms. Um, this is getting a lot of attention. A lot more apps are sort of moving this way. Um, in the uh, Ubuntu App Store, you can see that something like uh, an application like Spotify, if you install it from the Ubuntu App Store, it's actually downloading it and running it as a snap. It's not running it as a .deb file. You can see it via the source um, here. So, you know, this is kind of, you know, for the majority of users, like if you're using a snap or a flatpak application, it's generally one of those sort of web-based applications like um, Fap, uh, Spotify or Facebook or whatever. Uh, potentially even Dropbox. I haven't checked any of these apps um, other than Spotify, but a lot of app, more and more applications are sort of going this route. Um, there's a lot of advantages to it. Again, cross-platform cross platform compatibility. Uh, generally, once the application is up and running, there's no performance hit necessarily, uh, particularly if you have a modern desktop with, say, 4 to 8 gigs of RAM. Um, that being said, uh, I have I have seen like some slowdown using snaps on Ubuntu. Uh, for example, if I launch the calculator, uh, which is the .debian version of the calculator versus using the .snap or the snap version of the calculator, uh, even though it looks completely the same, the functionality is completely the same, the apt version will just launch immediately and the snap version takes a while. I think it's because the runtime needs to sort of boot and load if I don't have the runtime already running on my on my desktop system and, 
and then that adds like a little bit of extra lead time for something which I would think would be a really easy application to launch. Um, again, probably too much information, but just letting uh, everyone know that there are these other two runtimes out there. Um, you can install applications, you can update applications via the command line using snap search application name or flatpak search application name and then flatpak install application name or snap install application name. These these are ways to install additional applications. And at the end of the day, um, for the majority of users, all that means is that you have even more applications, with even more software available to you so that you don't feel like you're missing out by running Linux versus, say, running another type of desktop OS like, like Windows or Mac OS. So install and setup. Um, a lot of people these days when they're installing uh, Linux, they're probably going to use like a pen drive, like a, a USB uh, drive to install it. Uh, what you want to do is you want to go to the website. So for example, if I go over here, we can just go to, um, say I want to go to Linux Mint. and I can go to the downloads and then from here I can just pick whichever version I want to download. Um, this current version that I'm running right now is XFCE uh, which is just a lighter weight desktop. Um, the user interface Linux Mint tries to keep homogeneous between them. Uh, Cinnamon is, is a great desktop. Mate is a great desktop. Uh, X, XFCE is just a little bit lighter. Um, I'm actually running this as a virtual machine right now so I went with the lighter distribution but you just basically download it. Um, probably for any modern desktop these days, you would want 64-bit. That frees you from memory restrictions that you would have on 32-bit, and it's it's just more updated. So typically, just you know, click the 62-bit, and then you just pick whichever mirror is closest to you. If you're in the U.S., you maybe click any of these guys. Um, you'll notice a lot of these people are like supercomputing or universities, because a lot of these educational sectors are active hosts of Linux, so they'll, they'll host various variants of Linux. Um, and you just pick whichever one is closest to you, download it, and then you can continue on and set up the uh, USB, which will be bootable. So when you download it, it'll come as an image file, which is called .iso. If you install uh, Windows, um, it'll also probably come either with a DVD or these days it'll probably just install, it'll give you an ISO download and similar things you can set up a US, bootable USB. Uh, put it into your machine. Um, via the BIOS you would hit something like an F2 or uh, F12 for the, the boot menu or delete. Um, that'll show up when you first boot your machine. You'll you'll get like a, a really quick prompt typically. Um, but you know if you're not sure what it is like when you're just restart your machine, start mashing F2 and delete and see see what comes up and then you should be able to get into the BIOS. From the BIOS you can then pick the boot drive so it would be a, a similar picture like this where you can pick which boot drive you want and pick the, the USB boot drive. Once you pick the, the boot drive then you can go in and set up the, set up the screen. Uh, in order to set up <coughs> Linux, most Linux distributions probably only take about 20 gigabytes of hard drive space. You can partition it as well. So say for example you only have a laptop at home with only one hard drive inside, that's not a problem. You can install on a smaller partition of your Windows desktop and most modern Linux desktops will offer like a dual boot option. Uh, what happens with dual boot is when you install Linux on your desktop then the, when it first installs and then sets up it'll show uh, a little prompt saying, oh, do you want to boot your Linux distribution? Do you want to boot your Windows distribution? You just select your Linux. Um, Linux will always default to itself, obviously, but you can always, you know, go back to your Windows distribution and make sure that you're not, like, adversely affected by installing Linux. Um, also, one nice thing about Linux is that pretty much every Linux distribution these days has, like, a try before you buy. So you can just in set up your boot drive and then you'll run a live version of Linux, um, and we'll show that in the tutorial in just a minute. So you can run Linux, set it up, and then it'll be, you know, there and available to you, and you can just, you know, sort of play around with it without actually having to install it on your local drive. So this is kind of what it looks like. Um, if you have like a live USB, uh, this is universal USB installer. Uh, this this platform is kind of nice because it also lets you say you can set persistent file size. This persistent file size allows you to actually um, anything that you save to a live uh, instance of 
of Linux, like when you first boot it and it boots into it, it won't save the settings, it won't save the files, it won't save anything. It just lets you use it until you turn it off. As soon as you turn it off, everything's flushed from memory and then you just start all over again. Um, Universal USB installer lets you actually, you know, add some more persistent file size. So you can add a little bit, like, however big your boot your boot drive is, your USB drive, if you have a 32 gigabyte U USB drive, you might be good. Uh, performance won't be great, but you, you can just use that as like your standard, you know, sort of Linux go-to and, and start playing around with all sorts of things. Um, and then that will actually be perpetual. So every time you reboot, you switch machines, uh, you take your USB, you just plug it into something else, boot from the USB, and all of a sudden you're in your home environment again. So it's, it's, it's really, uh, quite an interesting, uh, way of using things. Again, performance tanks, but at the same time, you have like a huge amount of flexibility and you can do all sorts of things by, do, by running it like that. Um, and then once inside the operating system, then we can do lots of different things. So let's do this. So here we have um, Linux Mint booted in the live USB for the first time. Uh, this is running on a virtual machine actually, um, but it, it would be the same for pretty much any uh, you know desktop uh, distribution that you're running. So we're just running through the, the tutorial. What you'll notice is you'll see um, up in the left hand corner there's a little CD install Linux Mint. You click double click on that to open up this interface that we're running through right now. Um, here we're showing that you can you know select your boot drive and you can do all sorts of options and uh, just running through this, we can, you know, the default setting is erase this and install Linux Mint. Um, if you're running a dual boot, it would automatically detect like you're running a dual boot and then you can create a partition or a couple of partitions to, to install Linux Mint on available space. Um, so there's plenty of ways to make sure that you preserve whatever's on your, on your operating system. Uh, once it goes through this, you select your region. So, for example, it could be Asia, it could be the U.S., it could be New York, Los Angeles. You just pick your time zone, basically. Um, I think this is very similar to the way uh, Windows sort of works. You enter a name for your user. This will be your primary user, and then this user by default will be given sort of root access. So they'll be part of the Sidoris group. Uh, you set up the password. And then you can choose if you want to log in automatically or require my password to log in. I always require a password to log in. It's just safer. Um, and make sure that, like, no one's going to access your data, like, if you lose your laptop or something like that. Then once you continue, um, you know, it'll start going through the install process. I'm going to speed this up in a minute. But while it's doing that, or, you know, even before you start the install process, you can do things like open Firefox. You can browse through the files. You can adjust, you know, all the things that you would want to do on Linux are available, and you can try it out using the live USB before you actually commit to installing it. Um, so you can sort of just play with it a little bit. And again, if you use that universal USB installer and create persistent storage, if you make any changes or any file changes, you can store that, you know, on the USB in the live installer. So here I'm going to just, you know, speed up the process again all the different things that you can sort of run through and play with uh, while all this isn't starting. Right, so that completed. Didn't really take that fast, um, but through the magic of video editing it, it did. Uh, once it's finished installing, uh, reboot, then remove your USB from your computer, restart, and as soon as it finishes restarting, you'll be prompted with this screen, which is the login. And then you log in with your uh, password of your of your main user that you just set up. Um, hopefully, you type the password correctly. And once you're in, it'll boot. Um, you may need to do some tweaks like, oh, I need to change the resolution, so that's what I'm doing here. I go to the display and I just bump it up to the res the actual resolution of my monitor. Uh, this is an old monitor, so it's a slightly lower resolution than maybe what most of you have. Um, it'll give this sort of welcome screen of first steps and tips to go through. Um, 
the first thing that I like to do particularly, um, I mean, there's the update manager and things uh, that you can go and click through. But one thing that I do like to do and I do need to recommend to a lot of users, particularly if you're using the Ubuntu distribution of uh, Linux, like if you're using Linux Mint or Ubuntu or uh, potentially elementary, a lot of these other things is configure the firewall. Um, Ubuntu, for some reason, doesn't have the firewall enabled by default. So uh, a lot of users, uh, myself included, when I first started using Linux, I think I was using Linux for years. I didn't even have a firewall running. So that was not good. Um, and you can just go through and, and in Linux Mint, you can just activate it. Um, if you're using Ubuntu, there's no firewall utility like we're showing right here. Um, so you actually have to activate it through the command line. So I'll show that right here. Uh, activating through the command line is also fairly easy. You just do sudo ufw. Uh, ufw is the um, the sort of the the fi standard firewall, which is basically used on all Ubuntu platforms. And Fedora or Red Hat, they use firewall D now. They used to use IP tables. Um, and all you have to do is type sudo ufw enable, and then it'll be enabled. So if we relaunch the firewall utility, we should see that crop up. So again, enter the password so you can launch it, and there it is. The status is enabled. So firewall's up. Anything incoming is denied. Anything outgoing is allowed. Um, that's just going to protect you from the majority of things that you're going to need to worry about. So once you do that, set it, forget it. Uh, every time you restart the machine, it'll be up and running. Um, and then I'm just going to show a couple commands uh, of what we can do. So ls, like we set, we showed in the screenshot, shows what's listed in that folder. Change directory, change the folder to documents. Uh, make a directory, say test. Then we ls again, we can see, oh, there's a new directory test. Go into test, there's nothing there. Uh, we can use nano. Nano is the default editing tool on Ubuntu. Um, the command line editing tool, so you can just type and edit and create text um, in here. This is very useful if you get into like more uh, low-level Linux things. Um, it's a very nice text editor. It has graphical interfaces. It's much easier to understand than a lot of other default text editors out there, so I typically tend to use it. Um, Echo, again, basically just says what we're doing. Again, cd space dot dot, you move up one directory. Um, so you can see here cd up one directory. If you go cd, if you type cd in your terminal, it'll take you back to the home directory. So echo, we're home. Um, and then, you, you know, echo just returns the output of whatever, whatever you just typed in. Exit, close. And that's kind of the basic introduction. Uh, you click over here and then you can shut down the system, log off, suspend, whatever you want to do. And that's pretty much it. A really quick uh, tutorial introduction of Linux Mint and everything that um, about setting up Linux. Thank you.